So for the next session, I'm happy to introduce the chair for the next session. And um, um, the, the chair for the next session is uh, Dr. Uh, Melstrong, uh, Lale Melstrong, who is MDP, uh, MDMS. Dr. Melstrom is an associate professor of surgery and immune oncology and chief of division of surgical oncology at City of Hope uh, National Medical Center. She obtained her MD degree from Well Cornell uh, Medical College in New York City. She completed uh, her general surgery residency at Northwestern University in Chicago in 2010 and earned a master's degree in science in the clinical investigation in 2007 at Northwestern University. Upon completing residency, she completed a surgical oncology fellowship and a memorial, at Memorial uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. She's a New Yorker. Um, she has co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed publication uh, uh, chapters and reviews editorials in liver and pancreatic cancer. She is NIH funded and has academic interest in telehealth and RNA methylation. Welcome, Dr. Melstrom. Thank you, Dr. Ogembo, for uh, inviting some surgeons to this symposium. So we, we appreciate it. Uh, I'm very excited to welcome our first speaker for the session, Dr. Michael Sophia, to give his presentation on curing chronic viral hepatitis, a story of transformational success and another of enduring hope. Dr. Sophia is the chief scientific officer and co-founder of Arbutus Biopharma Inc. in Warminster, Pennsylvania. Dr. Sophia received his PhD degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and has over 30 years of research and development experience with several biotech pharmaceutical companies, including Pharmacet, uh, where he was responsible for the discovery of Sofubavir, an approved drug which cures hepatitis C virus infection and which ultimately resulted in the acquisition of Pharmacet by Gilead. Gilead. His Research focus on hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and coronavirus antiviral drug discovery and development. Dr. Sophia has won numerous awards for his work in the field of antiviral therapy, including the Lasker DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award for his outstanding discovery contribution and achievement in the field of medicine. The prestigious Cameron Prize for Therapeutics from the University of Edinburgh in recognition for his discovery of Sophospear and the Economist 2015 Innovation Award in the Bioscience category for developing a rapid cure for hep C. Dr. Sophia has published over 100 articles and holds 55 US patents. He holds numerous memberships, including the American Chemical Society and the Royal Society of Chemistry. He serves on many editorial boards, including the ACS Medi uh, Medicinal Chemistry Letter, Infectious Disorders, Drug Targets. A welcome, Dr. Sophia. Thank you, Dr. Melstrom, for the kind introduction. So we're going to take a little bit of turn of events here. We're going to now switch to hepatitis uh, viruses. Um, and so there are five major uh, viral hepatitises. However, there are really only two viral hepatitises that are chronic. That's hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Hepatitis delta is also chronic, but it requires hepatitis B um, uh, co-infection to be uh, actually uh, able to exist in the body. So when you look at um, viral hepatitis, um, about one, uh, every third person on the planet actually shows evidence of viral hepatitis. There are over 300 million individuals chronically infected, uh, 250 million with hepatitis B, 75 million with hepatitis C. Uh, 1.3 million die each year. 80 to 90% of all liver transplants is associated with hepatitis B or C infection. Um, and in fact, if you look at if you look at viral hepatitis, the, the progression of viral hepatitis um, and the number of deaths associated, the projection is for a skyrocketing of, of, of deaths associated with viral hepatitis into the future. That's in contrast to what you see now happening with either tuberculosis, HIV, or malaria. So, so the future of viral hepatitis is, 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 not, um, is not without concern. 
So what about liver cancer associated with chronic viral hepatitis? So liver cancer is the sixth most common cancer worldwide, fourth leading cause of cancer-related death globally, about almost 900,000 new cases in 2018 and projected to be more, more than 1 million cases uh, by 2025. It's the fastest increasing cause of cancer-related death in the U.S. Uh, since, early, since the early 2000s. Um, it's the leading cause of liver transplant um, patient in hepatic resection uh, and also, uh, excuse me, hepatic resection as a, the mainstay in HCV curative therapy, HCC curative therapy. The risks, the major risk for HCC turns out to be uh, viral hepatitis, either hepatitis B or hepatitis C. Um, when you look at viral hepatitis and liver cancer, um, chronic HPV infection accounts for greater than 50% of all HCC. Um, HCV is the most common underlying HCC-related liver disease in North America, European Union, as well as Japan, with an annual risk of, of, of 3% overall. 31% of U.S. cases are related to HCC, 21% uh, HCV, and 21% globally. So let's start with HCV. <clears throat> so HCV is a, a plot, positive sense RNA, oops, a positive sense RNA virus. <clears throat> there are a number of ge different genotypes associated with it. What's what's uh, maybe the advantage of HCV uh, is that there's no viral reservoir associated with it, and it doesn't integrate into the human genome. However, there is no preventive vaccine uh, even today. So. Uh, Hepatitis C replicates only in the cytoplasm of a liver cell, and the hepatitis C virus genome consists of 10 proteins, three structural proteins, and seven non-structural proteins. The non-structural proteins are the targets for uh, therapeutic development. And one of the challenges with hepatitis C in therapeutic development, and also associated with the, the lack of a preventive vaccination, turns out to be related to the fact that it has a very error-prone RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, meaning its, its, its genome uh, is produced <laughs> with a significant uh, error associated with it because there's no really proofreading function um, and it has a very high replication rate in the body. So the challenges around the early 2000s was <clears throat> to develop a therapeutic that could potentially eliminate HCV. Now, there are a number of challenges associated with that. A uh, number of key questions that existed at the time, some of the major ones were resistance, how much and how fast, obviously a very high <clears throat> uh, um, replication rate that's very error prone, a, a number of genotypes which, which are, are varied. Um, and the other thing was this use of interferon. So interferon was used for, for many years uh, from the late 1980s. Um, the problem with uh, interferon was the, the uh, um, very difficult nature of the therapy. Uh, most patients who started therapy never completed therapy because of the significant adverse events associated with interferon therapy, whether it be anemia, uh, neurological side effects, et cetera. And so the, one of the questions was, could you ultimately eliminate interferon from therapeutic use? Um, now, now the, the fault leaders in a field felt that, that the um, HCV drug profile uh, needed to look like this, meaning that you had a SVR rate, which sustained virological response 12 weeks after off therapy. So that's no virus uh, observed uh, after the, the therapy was discontinued, subsequent to 12 weeks. Um, it needed to be extremely well tolerated, very convenient, short duration of therapy, and a simple dosing regimen, and effective in a broad patient population. So uh, either pan-genotypic or a number of different patient populations, whether it be um, uh, different ethnicities that actually responded very differently to interferon itself. So we began in, on this project in around 2004 and uh, decided to focus on one of the uh, viral uh, non-structural protein targets, and that is the um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the NS5B. The reason rationale for this was the fact that, that it was highly conserved across all genotypes, and then the catalytic machinery at the active site was also very highly conserved, obviously, and, and any 
mutation at the active site will cause significant reduction in fitness of the virus. Um, so we began the, the process um, and, and actually identified this small molecule. It's a nucleoside known as P, what we call at the time PSI 6130. What's very unique about this, this, this particular nucleoside was that it was pangenotypic. So, so this was really quite interesting because inf interferon, for example, really only treated genotype one patients very well and wasn't very effective against the other genotypes. And also, in fact, uh, when you looked at other targets that were being looked at, either the viral polymerase, uh, excuse me, the viral protease, or this NS5B, uh, 5A replication complex, they were all very specific genotype one agents being developed for those. So, so really no pangenotypic potential. But <clears throat> this small molecule seemed to show uh, at least preclinically, fairly significant pangenotypic profile. It also was very safe for a nucleoside itself. Uh, nucleosides had this sort of a history of, of significant toxicities associated with them, anemia being one of them. Um, but this particular molecule seemed to be very safe. In fact, you can give grams of it to an animal and see no, no adverse events. And a very high barrier to resistance. There was a resistant uh, um, genotype associated with this, um, this was the uh, S282T mutation, but it actually had a very low fitness, it was only 15% fit. Um, and that that um, mutation was actually not seen pre-existing in, in the HCV population clinically. But the problem with this molecule, it has a poor PK profile and it produced a lot of the uridine metabolites. So, so the cytidine base would, would be metabolized in the body to a uridine base. And that uridine um, um, analog was completely inactive against the virus. So uh, we ultimately uh, went and developed this particular molecule known as RG7128. This molecule had improved oral pharmacokinetic profile. Um, it had uh, a first clinical proof of concept for a nucleoside uh, in the sense that it showed a 2.7 log reduction after 14 days in HCV genotype 1 patients. Uh, but it also, for the first time for any small molecule, showed clinical efficacy in a genotype other than one, so a genotype 2-3 patient. We also saw very good activity. Um, the problem with this uh, molecule was that, in fact, that it acquired a very high drug load, so about two, two grams per day um, in a BID. And it also continued to form this, this inactive uridine metabolite. <laughs> So we ultimately decided to redesign uh, uh, this and 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 see what we could uh, learn from uh, the metabolism of this molecule. And it turns out that if you look at the uridine derivative, um, although the uridine nucleoside was not active, if you gave the triphosphate of the uridine nucleoside, um, at least look at the enzyme activity of it, it turned out to be a very potent inhibitor of the viral polymerase uh, in isolated enzyme assay. So we ultimately, and what was also interesting about that was in fact that it it, um, <clears throat> it was uh, at, at a very long half-life in liver cells, which meant we could possibly give it once a day and it formed, it really accumulated significantly in liver cells. So ultimately what we ended up doing was developing a prodrug of monophosphate known as this molecule here, uh, PSI 7851. Um, and the reason why is that, because the problem with the the, the uridine nucleoside was the fact that it could not be phosphorylated. So it could not be, the first phosphorylation step was not happening in the phosphorylation cascade to make the active triphosphate metabolite. And so we made this prodrug um, uh, of this uh, uridine nucleoside, and it turned out that this prodrug, uh, we'd also designed it to be liver targeting um, because we were able to take advantage of the metabolism uh, profile of this kind of, of, of moiety that allowed us to to uh, specifically release the prodrug in the liver cell and therefore the, um, take advantage of first pass metabolism that allowed us to, to, to uh, 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 selectively target the liver and not have uh, any significant uh, systemic circulation of, of either the prodrug um, or the, the metabolites. And it also turned out that this drug, this molecule was 10 times more potent intrinsically than its predecessor, the high, very high uh, hepatic accumulation. In a phase one clinical trial, we demonstrated at 400 milligram dose once a day, over three days, we saw about a nine, two, uh, two log drop in ACV RNA 
with no resistance and no adverse events associated. So this is the first clinical proof of concept of actually any uh, nucleoside pro-drug targeting the liver. Um, it also was active in genotype 2, 3 patient populations, so we had this pangenotypic profile that we wanted. Um, this molecule um, uh, turned out to be a, a mixture of isomeric uh, molecules at this particular phosphorus center, so we decided to make the single isomer um, of that, and that molecule was PSI-7977, which is known as sofosbuvir today. So if you look at, at, at this particular molecule, sofosbuvir, it was uh, pangenotypic. It had a very high barrier to resistance. It uh, can combine with other mechanism of action agents, and that was important because the belief was that just like in HIV for HCV, to get the most potent uh, therapeutic, you need to be able to combine it with other mechanism of action agents uh, against the virus. Um, it had a, essentially an unmatched safety profile. Um, that's right quite unique for um, a nucleoside itself. Again, uh, we give very large doses of this molecule to animals uh, without seeing any adverse events associated. And it had this liver targeting characteristic. The other quite unique aspect is that when you compare the single isomer version to the, to the mixture of isomer 7851, we saw an enhanced 1.5 log drop in HBB in it, I mean, RNA. So, uh, the, but however, the, the key clinical trial, the pivotal clinical trial was this one. It's a pretty famous trial now known in, in, in the hepatology world. It's called Electron. Um, and what we wanted to do was really see, could we now um, uh, not include interferon in combination therapy? So everything else everyone was doing prior to this was including interferon in combination with their DAA or direct acting antiviral agent whether you be a protease inhibitor or NS5A or even other nucleosides that people were developing. But we decided that we wanted to see, could we in fact eliminate interferon? And what we showed was that, a comp, uh, um, that PSI 7977 alone plus ribavirin, which is another small nucleoside orally active agent, could give you 100% cure rates in, in H HCV patients. So this essentially changed the, the dynamic of of curative therapy in the HCV field. And ultimately, um, this molecule went to phase three clinical development and showed greater than 90% cure rates in hepatitis C patients across multiple genotypes. Um, and in, in December 6, 2013, so almost 10 years ago now, um, sofosbuvir was approved as the first interferon-free cure for hepatitis C uh, branded as Sovaldi. Oh, this was the end. Um, you know, it worked pretty well on genotype one patients that were uh, intolerant to interferon, but in a broad genotype one patients, it was not, it was less effective. It was only about sixty percent effective. So the co combination therapy was ultimately developed with sofosbuvir and the NS five A inhibitor ladipasvir by Gilead Sciences, um, to ultimately to get uh, greater than ninety five percent cure rates across all genotype one. Uh, patients, um, and that molecule now is known as Harvoni, that combination. So this Harvoni was launched in January 2014. That's not the end of the story. Um, uh, ultimately, the combination of sofosbuvir uh, plus valpatosvir, which is now a pangenotypic NS5A inhibitor, uh, ultimately led to the drug Epclusa, which, as you see here, greater than 97% cure rates across multiple genotypes. Um, and uh, in fact, um, is the the now the most used drug in in HIV curative therapy globally. Um, there was another combination made of a triple combination that included NS three four eight proteus inhibitor. This was really salvage therapy for a lot of the NS five A uh, con containing um, um, agents that uh, curative agents that got out there because that AC. Uh, um, the NS5A inhibitors turned out to have a very low barrier to resistance. And so you need to uh, bring in a, a, um, a to, to sort of mop up the, the resistant, uh, the resistant uh, the patients with this triple combination therapy. The sofosbuvir turns out to be the backbone of, of many of the major therapeutics 
now for HCV, primarily because it's pangenotypic. It's very safe, has a very, very um, high barrier to resistance. And so it protects any of the other agents in the combination that, that you put it with. So what does that mean for patients? So for patients today, that means interferon-free cure therapies, oral fixed dose, short duration, so either eight to 12 weeks of therapy, one pill once a day for eight to 12 weeks, 95% cure rates across all genotypes, um, high cure rates for difficult to treat patient populations, either cirrhotics, HIV drug users, or all ethnicities, now used as a pediatric version as well. Um, it turns out that you can now treat patients who are liver transplant list and their, their liver functions improve enough so that they don't need liver transplants, or you can transplant um, um, HCV infected livers into other patients and cure the patient once they have um, that transplant occurred. Um, it turns out sofosbuvir is the backbone now of, of uh, HCV elimination strategies. So in countries like Egypt and Georgia, um, Australia, for example, now have made tremendous progress to eliminating HCV in their H in their populations. Um, uh, and it's resu resulted in a 65% reduction in liver-related deaths in the West. But to this group, the DA HCV cures is associated with a 79% reduction in hepatocellular carcinoma risk and 50% reduction in ACC cases between 2014 and 2019. So a major impact on, on the uh, the risk associated with uh, HCC as a result of, uh, of having hepatitis uh, HCV. So this is a great success story, um, uh, but there is another story still to be told and that's HBV. So HBV is a, another hepatotropic virus, but it's very different. So HCV is a plus, plus sense RNA virus. Um, HBV, it turns out to be is a DNA virus. It has a very unique a uh, uh, um, genome that has multiple overlapping reading frames associated with it in a very complex life cycle where the virus enters the cell and deposits within the cell what is known as uh, relaxed circular DNA that takes advantage of the, uh, the host DNA repair mechanism to develop this thing called covalently closed circular DNA or CCC DNA. CCC DNA is a very long-lived, very stable form of viral DNA, and it's from CCC DNA, of which all downstream new virus is produced, and num number of these things called subviral particles are produced, and other viral proteins. Now, subviral particles are coated, in, in, as well as, as HPV virions are coated with this thing called S antigen. S antigen uh, plays an um, important role, or at least believed to play an important role in the way this virus controls the host immune response. So there's a thing called immune exhaustion where the virus is not recognized by the immune system or the or infected cells are not recognized. So, so the virus can live unimpeded in the liver um, doing its thing. Uh, uh, and uh, so the question is, um, you know, how do you now address uh, HBV uh, cure? Now, it turns out there is a preventive vaccine that was uh, developed uh, in the late 1970s and available in the early 1980s, um, and it's been given, obviously, globally. But still, there are still 250 million-plus people infected with chronic hepatitis B globally, resulting from mother-child uh, transmission um, at birth uh, and from IV drug use uh, globally. So... Um, what can you do? Uh, so it turns out that there are two uh, drugs, uh, actually three, um, that are nucleoside agents um, that help suppress viral replication. They don't clear the virus. They're long-term therapy. Um, but what has been shown is that, in fact, if you can arrest viral replication, you can um, reduce the risk of getting hepatocellular carcinoma. But if you're able to actually achieve what they call functional cure, and functional cure is undetectable HBV DNA, undetectable S antigen levels, with or without the production of S antibodies post cessation of therapy, six months, you can actually reduce it even more dramatically. So S antigen clearance, so clearing this viral antigen produced by this virus in very large quantities, you know, uh, allows you to, in fact, improve the, the risk profile for for any individual of getting hepatocellular carcinoma. 
But one of the problems is, is that these nucleosides, although they reduce, you know, uh, HBV DNA levels pretty well, um, they normalize ALT pretty well, they don't result in much loss of S antigen. So you need to take these drugs for the rest of your life. And patients don't like to take drugs for the rest of your life. So how can you develop a curative therapy for hepatitis B? So a strategy that we've been implementing, it really takes advantage of three key aspects. One is you need to drive viral replication down as much as possible. Number two, you need to actually drive down the amount of, of S antigen being produced. If this antigen is actually um, part of this immune exhaustion phenotype, you know, can you drive that down and, and cause um, uh, immune restoration of some type? But you also might believe you may need to actually boost the host immune response. So you need to be able to do all these three things to ultimately succeed in a combination therapy for HB. So um, nucleosides are pretty good at, at inhibiting viral replication, although other, uh, other approaches are being looked at, but these are uh, now generic agents that, that work very well. But how do you actually inhibit the production of this, this S antigen agent? So an approach that we've taken is really looking at siRNA. <laughs> And we've developed this molecule now known as Inducerin or AB729. It is a galnac conjugated siRNA agent, meaning it has a, uh, an acetylgalactosamine linked to the, the uh, uh, oligonucleotide uh, piece. And which is unique about this, this HBV uh, genome because of its overlapping reading frame, you can actually develop one siRNA. And if you pick the right trigger site, you can actually knock down all viral proteins being produced viral genetic material. And that's what we did. Um, this, this siRNA uh, is a single trigger agent, um, uses liver targeting by the acyglycoprotein receptor, and inhibits HBV replication, reduces all transcripts, and addresses integrated S antigen transcripts. So HBV actually integrates some transcripts into the host genome. And from these integrated transcripts, especially the S antigen transcript, it produces lots of S antigen. And so you want to be able to knock that antigen down as well. And so this particular uh, siRNA is able to address the integrated S antigen as well. It's pangenotypic across all genotypes, and it's active against these nucleoside-resistant variants. So what does this look like? In an animal model, we were demonstrated in an AAV mouse model that we can actually dose-dependently reduce um, HBV uh, S antigen levels uh, by four logs. We're also able to demonstrate in the liver that you can actually not only reduce S antigen levels in the liver, but other, R other HBV RNAs and in the serum HBV DNA. Again, we cut all viral transcripts. And actually, you can show by electromicrographs that you can actually clear um, the S antigen from, from the liver. Now, taking this into the clinic, uh, we, we were able to demonstrate either dosing 60 or 90 milligrams either four, uh, once every four weeks, once every eight weeks, or even once every 12 weeks, that you can actually get a two log drop in the production of S antigen um, from, from the administration of this siRNA. It's a subcutaneous operation. Um, in fact, the S antigen levels, once taken off therapy, actually remain pretty low. Uh, they don't necessarily go to zero, but they also re they remain very low at this, at what is um, sort of a, a, um, a less than about 100 international units per ml, which is an important number considering, um, you know, the uh, importance of low S antigen for patients ultimately achieving uh, S antigen loss. Some patients did achieve S antigen loss, um, uh, not don't understand why, but as you can see, there are a number of patients that went very, very low now, one of the things is, does that reduction in S antigen ultimately lead to some kind of immune reconstitution? Um, in fact, we were able to demonstrate in a, a very small subset of patients that when you reduce S antigen, you actually begin to see some re immune reconstitution by looking at uh, HBV uh, interferon gamma um, production. Um, this is sometimes associated with a small ALT elevation. Um, but you're also able to demonstrate that, in fact, you can actually reduce um, the, the exhausted T cells associated with HBV as demonstrated in some of these. So we're getting some immune reconstitution happening, but not enough. 
So the next question is, what else do you need to add on to this? And one of the things that we've been looking at is actually looking at checkpoint blockade. So it's been demonstrated that that checkpoint blockade, PD-1, PD-L1 axis, may be playing an important role in HPV uh, in, uh, immune exhaustion. And um, in fact, PD-L1 is expressed, is upregulated on HPV infected uh, cells, and PD-1 is upregulated on HPV specific T cells and B cells. We demonstrated in an animal model when you get a uh, PDL1 inhibitor with an S antigen reducing agent, you actually get um, reconstitution of um, HPV T cell response. So, one of the things we wanted to do is deliver, uh, develop a, a checkpoint blockade agent, a PDL1 agent, but a small molecule instead of a, an antibody. And one of the concerns of antibodies is because of the long duration of effect, you get a lot of immune related adverse events. And one of the things we wanted to do is minimize that in an HPV patient population. And so we decided to go with a small molecule approach here um, that we believe by liver targeting that small molecule um, and, and taking advantage of PKPD relationships, we can actually minimize the adverse events associated with checkpoint blockade. And this was done uh, using structure-based drug design. So uh, we were able to, to identify a series of small molecules that have very potent uh, activity um, uh, both binding and functional activity uh, against um, uh, the pd one protein. And, and in fact, what happens is this molecule um, uh, causes dimerization of pd one protein by anti-parallel dimerization event. And it's actually operated by a very different mechanism than, than, than an antibody does. So what this molecule, these molecules do is they cause dimerization on the surface of pd one internalization um, into the into the cytoplasm, ultimate degradation of the PDL1 protein. Um, so not just binding and blocking like an uh, antibody does. You can actually also uh, reconstitute, completely reconstitute on the surface of a of a cell all the PDL1 by simply washing out the drug. So again, this is sort of leads to our belief that we could have a much safer um, and less long acting uh, a checkpoint blockade event. So uh, this molecule, uh, our, our clinical candidate uh, is this molecule AB101, so sing, uh, sort of single digit nanomolar activity uh, and actually against using uh, immune cells from chronic hepatitis B donors, we're actually seeing uh, immune reactivation or reconstitution similar to uh, pdl one antibody at tezolizumab. And in fact, in an animal model, um, it's a MC38 mouse tumor model, which we use as a uh, surrogate animal model here. Um, it turns out we can reduce tumor size, uh, tumor volume in a 28 day study by an oral EDL1 uh, inhibitor, AB101, uh, akin to uh, or e uh, at least equal to atezolizumab, again, show reconstitution of, uh, of uh, uh, T cells in, in the liver. So uh, this molecule now is currently in phase one clinical development. Hopefully, ultimately, in the future, will be combined with seven AB729 and Medusaran for the combination therapy for HPV cure. So what do we know? So chronic viral hepatitis is, is, a, is a major um, public health issue, at least the most prominent risk factor for HCC. Small molecule discovery of inhibitors of HCV results in significant by uh, cure rates and reduction in the risk of HCC. Um, pressing viral replication in HPV causes a um, improvement in risk factor for uh, HCC, uh, but really what you want to get to is functional cure, and that's, we believe, is going to be able to achieve by combination therapy that looks at uh, the three things, inhibiting viral replication, reducing S antigen load, and reactivating the response. And ultimately, I want to thank these people who all did all the work, uh, both on the HCV work um, back at my former company, Pharmacet, and now uh, all the HPV work here. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Sophia. So our next uh, presenter is Dr. Antonio Bertoletti. He is joining us virtually from Singapore. Dr. Bertoletti is an expert in the field of viral hepatitis with a specific interest in immunopathogenesis of HPV infection. And he's a professor of the Emerging, Emerging Viral Disease Program at Duke. 
uh, Medical School in Singapore. His current research is focused on developing new immunological-based therapies, uh, T-cell receptor redirected T-cells for treating HPV chronic infection and hepatocellular carcinoma. In 2020, after the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, his laboratory has been actively involved in the characterization of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, specific T-cell immune response in infected and vaccinated individuals. He began working in viral hepatitis as a medical student at the University of Parma in Italy. During his medical school specialization in infectious diseases, he spent two years at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, characterizing for the first time the Hep B virus specific cytotoxic T cell response in man. In 2006, he moved to Singapore, where he was the Infection and Immunity Program Director at the Singapore Institute for Clinical Sciences until 2013, become, before becoming a full professor at the Emerging Viral Disease Program at Duke. He also maintains an adjunct position at the Singapore Immunology Network. He, won, he has won uh, two consecutive terms, the Singapore Translational Research Award. Welcome, Dr. Bartoletti. His uh, coming to us virtually. Good morning. My name is Antonio Bertoletti. I'm working at Duke and US Medical School. And uh, I, I want first to thank the organizers of this uh, uh, Global Oncology Symposium on Oncogenic Virus for inviting me. I'm sorry that I cannot come to City of Hope. Uh, uh, it's a long fly. And in addition, I'm now recording this video because uh, the day of the conference, I will be traveling. So I hope to be present for the question and answer. Uh, in any case, I'm happy to present you some data about our attempts to use T-cell therapy against HBV-related hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, a therapy that we developed in the last 10 years. A uh, little bit of my background, which perhaps is important for what I'm going to show you. Uh, I am an infectious disease that has always studied hepatitis B virus, in particular T cell response in hepatitis B virus. So uh, we really thought that, uh, again, we can actually potentially engineer, we can actually engineer HBV specific T cells to use against HBV related hepatocellular carcinoma. And, and this is what I'm going to show you today. I just want to say that I have a conflict of interest because I have a co-founder of the Lion TCR, which is actually a biotech company that is developing this T cell receptor treatment for virus related cancer, particularly hepatocellular calcium. So let me start with very this simple point. I mean, uh, which is like uh, the majority of hepatocellular carcinoma in uh, Asia, uh, particularly here where I am and in China are really related to HBV infection. And I mean, you, you, you probably know about more uh, than me about uh, the limitation of the present therapy. And therefore, we thought that we can possibly use T-cell therapy to target hepatocellular carcinoma. And the rationale to using HBV-specific T-cell to target HBV-related hepatocellular carcinoma is schematically represented in this slide. Uh, the point is that uh, uh, we know that HBV DNA integration is present in, I would say, 80-90% of HBV-related hepatocellular carcinoma. So hepatocellular carcinoma that are arising in patients with chronic hepatitis B. We know that the proteins are produced. And an important point that I want you to, to, to remember is that we also know that HBV-specific T cells, so T cells specific for hepatitis B virus, they're actually mainly deleted in patients with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma because these are patients with chronic hepatitis B. And at the end of the day, the patients with chronic hepatitis B, one of the main points is that they have uh, defects of the T cell response. So we thought that actually we can engineer TCR-directed T cells specific for hepatitis B virus proteins and analysis. Uh, and target not only the HBV-infected hepatocytes, but also hepatocellular carcinoma. So basically using the viral antigen as a specific hormonal antigen. And therefore, you know, uh, having T cell that with a TCR with high affinity, with a really ability to recognize these cells that are tumor, but they are also expressing viral antigen. 
So in these slides, I just summarized basically what we are doing and what we have done in the past four or five years, where we have already treated patients with primary and secondary hepatocellular carcinoma. And what we are doing is, again, targeting HBV epitopes that are produced from HBV DNA integration that are present in hepatocellular carcinoma. We have already produced a large library of T-cell receptor, and T-cell receptor that recognize different epitopes, mainly present on envelope, uh, because the envelope protein is the one that is more integrated. Um, and then we really engineer the uh, T-cells uh, with different methods. Uh, now we are using mainly messenger RNA, which giving a transient expression of the TCR, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, and then uh, I will show you some data of the patients that we have been treated. And what we are thinking, it could be the potential advantage of using messenger RNA TCR redirected T cells for the treatment of this uh, uh, tumor. Uh, first, I'm going to go to, to try to answer a very simple question, which is uh, are indicated here. I want to tell you how we produce this TCR receptor, specific for hepatitis B, why we are using TCR receptor and not CAR T cell therapy, and why messenger RNA. So the first point is how do we get this uh, T cell receptor? Well, we got them from CD80 cells specific for hepatitis B that are present in patients with acute hepatitis. The patients with acute hepatitis do mount a good T cell response. We know that we select uh, from the PBMCs of the patients that have resolved acute hepatitis CD80 cells. We clone the DNA that is uh, synthesized in the alpha and beta receptor of different uh, uh, of uh, the T cell receptor. And we have now I would say quite a, a large library of T cells restricted by different HLAs that are indicated, for example, here, which are covering about 60% of Asian subjects. So some of HLA are mainly present actually in, in Asian, like HLA 11 and HLA B40. Uh, and one other point that I want to, to, to briefly mention is that when we are engineering uh, the T cells uh, with the T cell receptor that we got from patients with uh, acute hepatitis B, uh, not only the T cell receptor is expressed, uh, but it could be expressed on T cells that are coming from patients with chronic hepatitis B or healthy patients. And the point is that we can engineer T cells that have the same functionality and the same affinity of the T cells that we found in patients with acute hepatitis B. Uh, this is particularly illustrated by this figure where we test our TCR redirected T cells in comparison to the T cells that were taken from patients with acute hepatitis B. And uh, we target them, uh, let's say we use these T cells, these engineered T cells against target cells that were uh, pulsed with different concentration of peptides. And, and you can see there is basically no difference between our engineered T cells and the natural T cells that have been induced in patients with acute hepatitis B. And these T cells are recognizing HBV infected hepatocytes. So the other point is why we went to use the T-cell receptor and not CAR. A CAR, it could have been much easier because, as you know, the CAR recognizes conformational antigen that is present on the surface of the tumor cells. And the point is that you can use CAR T-cells to target patients without HLA restriction. You can basically use your product in all the patients. You don't have the select, you don't have to do selection of particular HLA, something that instead you need to do when you are using a classical T cell receptor to engineer your T cells, because the classical T cell receptor is HLA class one restricted, and therefore you need to match your T cell receptor with the HLA of the patient. So something that is getting more complicated, then you have different products. Well, the point is that in hepatitis B virus, for example, if we are going to test, uh, te uh, target the S antigen that is mainly integrated in hepatocellular carcinoma, we have a problem that actually in patients with chronic hepatitis B and hepatocellular carcinoma, well, the antigen is also produced, secreted in the circulation of the patients. And we, we know that there are patients that have even, I would say, very high level of uh, S antigen in uh, the in the, uh, in the serum of these patients. And, and, and therefore, potentially, as illustrated in these uh, slides, 
the S antigen that is present in soluble form can clearly block the CAR T cells because the CAR T cells are done actually with antibody recognizing the S antigen. But this is not happening with T cell receptors because this TCR recognizes short fragments presented by HLA clone. And we have done experiment in vitro to demonstrate that basically the, our TCR related T cells are not blocked by the presence of soluble S antigen. Uh, our TCR T cells were tested initially in xenograph model. I'm going briefly here just to show that the, our TCR directed T cells were able actually to lyse the tumor cells. And uh, uh, here we introduce uh, hepatocellular carcinoma expressing S antigen in, in uh, um, immunodeficient mice. Uh, the, the tumor, which is a human tumor, is growing uh, on, on, on the mice. And if we are in, uh, treating these mice with uh, T cells that were engineered with a T cell receptor recognizing the core antigen that was not present here. You can see nothing was happening. But if we were treating the mice with a T cell receptor, T cells engineered with a T cell receptor specific for the S antigen, you can see that we have a complete eradication of it. So in vitro, in sorry, in vitro and in a xenograph model, we can demonstrate that our TCR T cells are actually able to recognize and kill uh, the uh, hepatocellular carcinoma expressing HPV antigen. But let's go to the first patients that we treat. treat uh, we treat these patients uh, already many years ago, about 10, time flies. And uh, uh, this was a collaboration with uh, University College of London, Malamaini, Hans Staus, and uh, Vasin Kazim that helped us to engineer the T cells with viral vector and uh, with the University of Pisa. And University of Pisa, because uh, uh, actually uh, these colleagues of mine in, in, in Italy, they found these patients, uh, which was treated for an HBV-related hepatocellular carcinoma uh, about, uh, let's say, 10 years before. And he was treated with liver transplant. He was well for 10 years, and then he started to develop some extrahepatic metastasis. And he also became S antigen positive, but he was not HBV infected. There was no HBV infection of the liver. So it was a very, very weird case. So the, the idea of, of these uh, two clinicians that are actually two real good experts of hepatitis B was actually that this patient may have exam metastasis of hepatocellular carcinoma uh, in the lung. So they biopsy this metastasis, and actually they found that these metastases were indeed of uh, liver or origin, and we were able actually to do uh, a DNA extraction, understand that the DNA of the HBV antigen, uh, S antigen was present in this tumor. So basically this tumor have a complete DNA integration. It was producing S antigen, and we were able to demonstrate with an antibody able to recognize the HLA2 envelope uh, peptide complex, that these complex were present on the surface of the hepatocellular of this metastasis. So we treat these patients with TCR, redirected T cell, TCR redirected T cell specific for an envelope epitopes, uh, viral vector, so stable. We treat them with very uh, uh, low number of cells. Uh, and what we got? Well, we got really that the S antigen was absolutely reduced. I have to say that the time that we were, uh, uh, let's say, to produce this cell, to have all the ethical approval really took us more than one year. And when we were able basically to treat these patients, so really the patient was in a horrendous condition with metastasis everywhere. We made one infusion. Uh, we The patients then survived for another four or five months. We cannot say that we have real clinical evidence of uh, efficacy, except to the fact that he really saw that there was a complete reduction of the S antigen, which was very interesting. And I want to show you here this. I want again to remind you that the S antigen was coming only from the metastasis. And this is again the same patients that he actually underwent surgery and radiation therapy before uh, uh, being treated with uh, uh, adopted T cell therapy. And this is the drop of the S antigen that actually occurs in nine months when the patients were treated with surgical removal and irradiation. So you see, surgical removal and irradiation really cause a reduction of the S antigen. But then the S antigen keeps going up, and there was other, other surgical removal, and nothing was happening. 
But here was up, this is the reduction of S antigen that we observe when we infuse this very low number of cells. Again, demonstrated that our cells were really potent in a way. And this again was a very good uh, first demonstration that we can use viral antigen as a tumor antigen in hepatocellular carcinoma. There is, however, something that, that I need to say. This was a very peculiar patient. Why was a very peculiar patient? For two cases. One, he produced the entire S antigen. Two, there was no infection of the uh, liver, uh, reinfection of hepatitis B. And this is very important, and it's very important because the majority of hepatocellular carcinoma, in reality, they don't express the entire S antigen. And this is one of, let's say, of the criticisms that I always got, because most of the, uh, let's say, clinicians and other researchers told me, yeah, but you know, most of the hepatocellular carcinoma in HPV, they are actually viral antigen negative. We cannot see S antigen produced in the hepatocellular carcinoma. However, they don't consider the fact that in reality, our T cell, they don't recognize the whole antigen. And usually when you look for the presence of that antigen, you're using antibodies and the antibodies recognize the conformation of the antigen. The T cells instead recognize small, short epitope associated with HLA class one. So we actually demonstrated that our TCR redirected T cells, HBV specific, can actually recognize tumor antigen that have only HBV DNA integration, despite the fact that this tumor were HBV antigen negative when we tested with antibody. And here I'm showing this data. So we use basically different hepatocellular carcinoma line. This is an FG2 to 2.5. This is an hepatocellular carcinoma lines where we introduce the entire HBV DNA. And this uh, uh, tumor lines is uh, producing core and this antigen that we can detect with antibodies. This is another natural hepatocellular carcinoma lines that instead have DNA integration, but is completely negative with antibody for core and S antigen. So you would say that this uh, um, tumor cell lines does not produce S antigen, but in reality, our TCR redirected T cells that recognize short fragments were able to kill part of this uh, hepatocellular carcinoma lines, basically demonstrating that uh, TCR redirected T cells, HBV specific, can recognize hepatocellular carcinoma with HBV DNA integration. And you can have more information about this important point on this paper that we published in gastroenterology many years ago. We have, however, one other problem when we are want to treat uh, our uh, hepatocellular carcinoma in HBV chronic patients. And the fact is that at the moment, we don't have any proof that the TCR redirected T cells are actually able to distinguish between the uh, infected hepatocytes and the hepatocellular carcinoma. And this is a real problem. It is a real problem because, again, we cannot introduce large quantity of cells in a patient with primary hepatocellular carcinoma because we have, uh, we can be, we have to be careful about the safety of the patient. So this is why, actually, we are thinking that using messenger RNA TCR redirected T cell could be a better option. Uh, what is the difference between messenger RNA retroviral infection? The messenger RNA actually has the expression of a TCR is transient, as shown in this slide. You see high expression within one, two days, but then the TCR is disappearing in the T cells where we introduce the TCR information through messenger RNA. Different when we are using viral vectors, stable expression. But that could mean this time-controlled TCR expression could be useful because we can treat the patients with escalating doses. And this is exactly what we have done. And I will say also the other point is that we don't have any genetic manipulation. Uh, here again, I'm, I'm just showing you the fact that the TCR is expressed over time. But what I'm saying is that this possibility, that the, this possibility, the fact that the message RNA is actually expressed over for a short time, allow us to do a dose escalation infusion strategy and understand whether low the T cells might actually recognize more the infected hepatocytes. And uh, one other potential, uh, let's say, um, favorable uh, point about messenger and ATCR is that by infusing 
large quantity of T cells that are extremely uh, classical effect of T cells that are extremely functional. We can bypass the T cell exhaustion that can occur to uh, T cells that are stably uh, expressing the TCR and infuse only one time. But let me go to some examples. Uh, and I want you to show a couple of examples and also show you uh, to finish what we are thinking it could happen and what we are thinking could be actually an advantage of messenger RNA uh, TCR redirected TCR. So here I'm showing the, the, the results of the first patients that we treat using this transient uh, expressing TCS. And this was a patient that had hepatocellular carcinoma. It was uh, transplanted. And then he developed metastasis. Here, uh, we, we choose the TCR that uh, was restricted by B58. That was uh, the... HLA of the patients, but not of the new liver. So in a way, we were already thinking that this thinking, selecting the TCR in a way that it could not recognize HPV antigen in the new liver. And when we infuse different quantity of cells, this is the schematic representation of the main infusion that these patients have. Uh, and we got actually good results in these patients, really uh, exciting results, even though not complete. For example, these patients, got when we treat them already seven lung lesion metastasis. And we can actually observe, as is seen, as I show you here, that the metastasis, six out of seven, were really disappearing. We, we infuse the cells. Usually we have what we call this sort of pseudo progression. But then six out of the seven lesion were, uh, um, were gone. Uh, the other lesion, unfortunately not. So again, we have this sort of mixed uh, results every time. But what I think is in very in, in important was that we can see that in patients, when we are infusing the T cells, we are actually causing large inflammation, and I would say inflammation and activation of the T cells. Uh, and, and, and we look at this uh, thing here by analyzing the T cells uh, before treatment and after treatment, and we noticed that there was an activation of the T cells, even though the patient didn't have any side effects. So we were in inducing some sort of uh, inflammation of the immune system, some sort of activation of the immune system. And we also noticed out of, for example, of the four patients that were uh, treated and have metastasis of liver transplant, uh, in, uh, that have metastasis in after liver transplantation, we actually noticed that the patients that really have a, a very good response was the patients where we can see this sort of activation, general activation of the T cells after infusion. Uh, we went on because, and we were saying, okay, these are patients with liver transplant, the patients with liver transplant are slightly immunosuppressed. We have also this problem. I don't have now the time to, to explain how we can bypass the problem of immunosuppression, even though, uh, you know, I will be glad maybe during uh, the question of answer to, 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 to explain you how we are making, the say, now T cells that are resistant to the immunosuppressive effect of drugs. But what we have done, and here what I want to show you, is also the results in primary hepatocellular carcinoma, where really we have the problem that our T cell can recognize the tumor, but can also recognize HBV infected hepatocytes. So here are the data done in eight patients where we introduce our TCR redirected T cells. And what I want to point out is that actually we see some, let's say, inflammatory event, and I would say, uh, adverse event, which were basically increase of transaminases, particularly in two patients, where we saw actually a very high level of transaminases after infusion on only 100,000 cells. But then these are messenger RNA, the cells disappear, and in all the patients, the transaminases were actually going back to normal. Uh, these patients, particularly the B01, have some sort of serious event because you have 500 of transaminases and it develops a sort of joint that, however, was resolved without intervention. Uh, the point was that the other, we didn't see anything. But the fact is that only in the patients that have these uh, inflammatory events, we were able to see some clinical effect. So it looks to us that actually 
the T cells that were infused, they were really inducing some inflammatory events that cause the reduction of the hepatocellular carcinoma. But I want to show you that basically after the side effects of these patients where we induce liver inflammation, we have done some other infusion, but the reduction of the hepatocellular carcinoma was not really linked with the infusion of the cells. So it looked like to us that we are inducing, we are adoptively transfer the T cells, and the T cells, when they are causing inflammation, they can actually start new immunological events. And I'm schematically represented, just to finish uh, my presentation, this, uh, this point, what we are thinking is that we are introducing our TCR and the T cells that can actually directly go and lyse the tumor. But when we are able to infuse uh, and uh, um, start uh, localizing inflammation, we can have potentially the induction of new hepatocellular carcinoma cells that might actually persist in the patients and be able to control it. Clearly, this is still a sort of hypothesis, but we have some preliminary data that are supporting this hypothesis. And this is my last slides. And this last slides, I just show you some of the patients that we are treating now in Singapore. This again, patients with primary hepatocellular carcinoma. And the, these arrows represent the infusion of the TCR. And in these patients, we treated, we tested in the peripheral blood the presence of HBV specific T cells. Uh, and as I told you at the beginning, HBV specific T cells are basically not present in patients with chronic hepatitis B. And this is exactly what we find at the beginning. The T cells specific for different HBV antigen were not present. But progressively, after the infusion, we could see that we have this sort of induction of new HBV specific T cells. So potentially, we are thinking that our treatment in some patients can actually induce new hepatocellular carcinoma cells that are actually the one that are causing then the real clinical effect in these patients. And we hope really that we can demonstrate that in the future. Uh, I hope I convince you that our therapy could work uh, and he have potential. And I just want to finish here. This are, is my group. We have done all this work in collaboration with Lion TCR and two different hospitals. One is the 302 hospital in Beijing and the other one is the Singapore General Hospital. And I hope to be present to answer some of your questions. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I hope there could be some questions. Any questions from the audience to start? Okay, so um, I've been given some questions, but I have questions. So <laughs> this uh, this new agent, the AB101, uh, have you used it for any other, um, you know, MC38 is a colon cancer that has uh, studied it often for MSI high colon cancer as a model. Have you used it for any other malignancies in your, your work? Well, um, we, we actually have a study ongoing, well, a preclinical study, right, um, in an HCC animal model that looks uh, interesting and will report out, I think, at the upcoming ASLT meeting yeah. uh, in Boston next week. That That's very exciting. Uh, some of the other questions that uh, we were thinking about, in your, in your experience, what is an approval path for the HPV curative therapies and a suppressive therapy without loss of S antigen sufficient? So... <laughs> You know, currently the the approval paradigm is functional cure, which means uh, uh, undetectable HPV DNA in the serum, undetectable S antigen with or without uh, S antibody six months after cessation of all therapy. So that's the current um, regulatory approval pathway. Um, there is a lot of discussion about uh, an alternative potential pathway. To, to explore that would be suppressive S antigen therapy um, long term, off there, but off therapy, right? So some of these siRNA agents, including Inducerin, uh, allows you to, <clears throat> to reduce S antigen. So 48 weeks of Inducerin will then allow you to remove therapy. And we have actually removed nucleoside therapy as well. So all therapy. And you can see a, a low level 
okay, around 100 international units um, ex for extended period of time, so um, almost a year. Uh, the question is still whether that's an approvable, you know, paradigm for for HBV. And currently, in the in the current regulatory guidelines, it is not. I have a question for my oh, Dr. Bartoletti from, from Singapore has a question for you. <laughs> Go, ahead. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Michael. Hi, Antonio. Uh, I just want to, I, I was interested about, uh, the, let's say, this new combination therapy with uh, sRNA and uh, anti-PD-1. And, and I'm wondering whether you're thinking basically to select patients based on the fact that they can actually, you can see, for example, in vitro already, that the anti-PD-1 can actually increase uh, hbv specificity cells, or are you just thinking to try in every single patient? So, so basically, if you want to have a sort of uh, selection of patients based uh, on their profile of hbv specific T cells and uh, their ability to be, let's say, re restore with uh, your anti-PD-1 uh, molecule. Right. So our current paradigm is not to do the pre-selection is the all comers uh, treatment um, uh, that could change, but that's the current, you know, the current paradigm is to treat with a new plus induce to get to a low level, uh, hopefully 100 or below international units of S antigen, and then come in with the PDL1 inhibitor um, as, as our approach, uh, but not pre-select the patients based on, the, on, you know, PDL1, you know, uh, activation status. Dr. Gruber. Thank you. Steve Gruber, City of Hope. First of all, congratulations to superb talks. Dr. Bertoletti, I have a question for you regarding the mechanism of potential escape for metastases in the lung in T cell adoptive therapy. And I, I I think I recall a paper in the New England Journal in metastatic colorectal cancer, where I, I believe Dr. Steve Rosenberg's group had treated a patient with adoptive T-cell therapy and everything responded except one tumor. And they were able to demonstrate HLA loss as a mechanism of um, resistance. Have you been able to investigate what occurred in the possible mechanisms that would lead some metastases to respond and others perhaps to escape? Well, unfortunately, I was not able to analyze this. It definitely, I would say, when we saw, for example, in, in the patients that I, I show you, that was a liver transplanted patients, that there was clearly one metastasis that was not responding, it started to spread. That was maybe because already did it, it was different or maybe we were selecting something that was a possibility uh, to be honest we tried to get a new biopsy it was not possible uh, but it's definitely something that uh, we we think is is uh, possible to happen i would say that at the moment we are sort of i wouldn't say forced but yes the regulation are complicated and therefore we can use a, a t cell specific for a single tc uh, epitopes in reality i do think it's could be possible to, to already start to treat patients uh, engineering T cells with different epitopes because now we have a large library and probably this could actually overcome the problem of the selection. That I do think, as you as you pointed out, uh, has been demonstrated to happen at least in, in another, let's say, scenario with a different tumor. But I do think it's possible. Well, and clearly you demonstrated that you can dramatically lower the tumor burden, which makes even... Uh, met metastectomy, um, a possibility to um, lead to um, remissions uh, with a combination. They, very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. In, in some patients, I have to say, as, as I show, I mean, it's really work in progress. I, I do think we have some sign that something it could work, but we need really to understand selection of patients and, 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 and treatment uh, modalities. Thank you. So Dr. Bartoletti, I'll ask you a, a clinical question. I'm a liver surgeon. I just saw a woman with hepatitis C treated many years ago, now with HCC, um, not local, basically unresectable at this moment. Uh, have you done any neoadjuvant therapy with patients that subsequently go on to resection? It looks like more it's been in the context of metastatectomy. And then the second question I have for you is... Um, 
most patients with HCC aren't transplant patients. They're, they're de novo, you know, HCC. Um, any thoughts about how you deal with the impact of immunosuppression and the functionality of the TCR T cells that you're, that you're generating? The, uh, those transplant patients are in chronic immunosuppression. So you, you alluded to it, but you didn't really get into it in your talk. Okay, I, I, I will answer immediately the second question, which is easier. Uh, clearly, at the beginning, we have been treating patients with, uh, let's say, metastasis after liver transplantation. Uh, and, and these patients, we, we were, let's say, they, they are particularly under tacrolimus treatment. So now what we have been able to engineer, but we have not yet used, uh, but we have been able to engineer T cells that uh, are resistant to tacrolimus just by introducing on the T cells, in addition to the message RNA that is coding for the T cell receptor, calcineurin B mutated, which basically make the T cells uh, unable to respond to tacrolimus. Because we demonstrated in vitro, actually, that our TCR-directed T cells uh, with tacrolimus, they are losing 50% of the, uh, their functional list. Uh, so we have now, I would say, sort of, let's say, through engineering T cells, uh, we are able to make T cells that are resistant to tacrolimus, again, transiently resistant to tacrolimus, uh, therefore, we are not basically going to put cells that will be always resistant to tracrolimus. Also, we introduced this uh, mutated form of calcineurin B that is uh, basically blocking the effect of tacrolimus only for a short time. For the other question, I think it was more about, uh, let's say, whether, I, I mean, I would say that my clinical experience is still very limited in terms of how many patients we have been treated. Uh, we have treated in total seven patients with liver transplant and six patients with primary hepatocellular carcinoma. I personally think that uh, the single T-cell therapy will not be something that we have to use alone. I'm honestly thinking that uh, it will be good uh, to, let's say, associate uh, the T-cell therapy with, for example, checkpoint inhibitors, particularly now that we can, we have the idea that probably our T-cell therapy can induce new T-cells. This is something that I was thinking that we, we should use in the future. Uh, uh, the other point is that, uh, I mean, the, our T-cell therapy in general are expensive. I think now with message RNA, we can really reduce the cost of making this sort of uh, treatment more potentially possible. And also, I would say, more flexible to do it. Because at the moment, also using autologous T-cells became it's extremely complicated. Okay, Dr. Sophia, have you seen... Um... Uh, but clinical resistance with the sofosbuvir? Have you seen it in what context? So there really hasn't been any clinical resistance. There was only one case quite a number of years ago I think in the clinical trials that was under monotherapy, and they did see a patient with the S282T mutation. Um, but again, it was low fitness, and continued dosing of sofosbuvir eradicated that, that mutated um, virus. Okay, I think we've come to the time. Um, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Dr. Dimbo, and thank you to the organizing team for inviting me today. What an incredible symposium. That was really, really inspiring, and I'm just privileged to be able to present some closing remarks today. As a physician scientist who's committed to advancing precision medicine here at City of Hope, my team and I employ genomic-driven insights, clinical expertise, and advanced analytics to try to pioneer personalized prevention and treatment plans to transform the outco outcomes for patients, families, and their communities. Our City of Hope Center for Precision Medicine creates an environment for facilitating, advancing the frontiers of science, much like we heard today, uh, through the use of genomics and genetics, but largely uh, to create an environment and a resource uh, to better appreciate the ways in which we can recognize causes and targets of cancer, including oncogenic fusions and viruses that contribute to the causes of cancer. We also want to make sure that we are understanding the contributing causes to cancer within the diversity of the patients that we serve, both here in Southern California and at other sites in Arizona, Illinois, and uh, uh, Georgia. I I'm just reflecting today as I was listening to these superb lectures and interactions uh, about the great opportunity I had to have a sabbatical several years ago at the Catalan Institute of Oncology in Barcelona, uh, working with some of the world's leaders in HPV biology, Xavier Bosch, Xavier Castelsegay, and uh, Sylvia de San Jose, who really showed me how important it is to be addressing the types of questions we heard today from a global perspective. This is a way in which we can reduce the burden of cancer globally by addressing one of the major preventable causes of cancer. And as we've seen and just heard even more in that last session, the treatable causes of cancer as well. Last year, I spoke at a virtual City of Hope Global Oncology Forum, and that one focused on precision medicine. And what a pleasure and privilege to transition uh, to this year's Global Oncology Initiative to see the symposium grow and actually be in person as well as virtual. Thank you for being here today uh, and with audiences from all around the world to focus on oncogenic viruses, which as we heard contributes to 10% of cancers globally. I want to thank our speakers and chairs who are truly world-renowned experts for being here with us today and for very informative discussions, sharing your work, your insights, and providing comprehensive perspectives on the impact of oncogenic viruses and cancer burden, cancer control in lower and middle-income countries, and taking us into a deep dive into understanding molecular mechanisms and informing us on emerging therapies to tackle this cancer burden. I also want to thank you, our audience, for your engagement and presence here today. And this symposium was made possible thanks to the Global Oncology Initiative of Direct Director Dr. Ogembo and committee members, the sponsorship and support of uh, our City of Hope Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. John Carpton, who was here with us earlier today. He's also the Beckman Research Institute Director and our Director of uh, City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center Director. I also want to thank the organizing team consisting of members from our Cancer Center, the events team, our Center for International Medicine, the uh, Education Council audio and visual teams, our marketing and communications team, volunteers, and many internal and external stakeholders, partners, and collaborators who tireless, tirelessly worked these past few months to make this event successful. This also laid the foundation for many symposiums to come that will continue to serve as a platform to foster collaboration, showcase scientific and medical accomplishments and findings, and engage with our communities to inform ongoing efforts to mitigate global cancer risk and cancer burden. Thank you to all who were involved. At its core, the City of Hope Global Oncology Initiative is built on the profound understanding that it takes more than a village to address the growing cancer burden in our communities and beyond our borders. Today's symposium reflects this understanding and embodies the initiative's spirit of partnership and collaboration at every level from our speakers, session chairs, organizers, and our audience. Through our collective efforts, we can address disparities in healthcare, work with diverse global populations, and actively reduce the gaps 
that will unleash our full potential to implement preventive methods and bring the right drugs to the right patients at the right time, providing better care and outcomes for uh, our patients and communities holistically in a way that can actually do it more effectively and reduce the economic burden as well. I look forward to having many more conversations and opportunities for all of us to work together and to advance our pursuit of better cancer care and health outcomes globally. Thank you all. We, are, we look forward to seeing you next year at another Global Oncology Symposium. And thank you again for joining us here at City of Hope.